This clock's running a little bit slow, and I think mine is right, so um, we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Christine, manages the Integrated Roadside Vegetation Program here at the Tallgrass Prairie Center. She provides training and education to Iowa's county roadside programs and um, uh, conducts outreach to raise awareness about this program statewide and make it, um, make it more prevalent in the state. Previously, she worked for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Omaha, uh, where she developed and implemented ecosystem restoration plans. And she also worked for the USDA Agricultural Research Service in Brookings, South Dakota, uh, where she researched pollinator use of bio uh, bio biofuel oilseed crops. Christine received a BS in Environmental Studies in, and an MA in Biology from the University of Nebraska at Omaha, and her PhD in Natural Resource Sciences from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So we're super uh, happy to have been able to find Christine and bring her to the Tallgrass Prairie Center a few years ago. Um, just on a personal note, she's active in Toastmasters, our local chapter, and she and her husband have a dog named Shaggy. Okay. Well, thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Thank you, Stacy, for advertising and organizing the event and inviting me here. Before European settlement, most of this area of the country was tall grass prairie, with some riparian forests along streams and some savannas. There was bison and elk, periodic fires that helped maintain the prairie. And of course, this, this land is also really good farmland because of those deep prairie roots that added nutrients to the soil. So in the 1800s, much of the prairie was plowed up, continuing on to the 1900s. So this map shows roughly how much prairie is left in Iowa. Daryl Smith, the founder of the center, likes to compare it to a 1,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. If you compare if you picture a 1,000-piece jigsaw puzzle, one piece is left. One-tenth of one percent is left. That's our best estimate for roughly how much of the prairie is left. has never been plowed. So with the loss of the prairie, we've lost a lot of ecosystem services, mainly because, or largely because of the deep plant roots. They reduce soil erosion. They improve water quality. They help sequester carbon. So there's a lot less plant roots on the landscape without the tall grass prairie. So there's many benefits to the prairie, but for my presentation, I'm going to focus more on the above ground habitat because there's a lot of interest in that right now, especially for pollinators. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the, the declining bees and butterflies. And that's why there's a lot of interest in habitat right now. Keeping in mind, there's a lot of benefits to prey, but for this presentation, we're going to focus on habitat. So why are bees and butterflies declining? Well, there's many interacting factors. There's climate change. There's different chemicals in the environment. There's parasites and pathogens. But one of the main reasons is the lack of diverse wildflowers for them to feed on. Now studies have shown, just as in humans, if bees and butterflies has, have a less diverse diet, they don't have a varied diet, their immune response is weakened, they're not as healthy, and this unhealthy diet makes them even more susceptible to the effects of parasites and chemicals. And also, if there's less floral resources out there, they're traveling more, trying to find the wildflowers. So they're being exposed to different stressors in the environment because they have to travel a lot looking for food. Where if there's large areas of nice habitat, they won't have to travel so much and be exposed to all these chemicals. So it's a lot of factors, but the lack of diverse habitat is a large one. So honeybees are in the news a lot. It's, they have a lot of economic importance. They're important for honey production. In the U.S., the honey industry is worth about $335 million a year. In Iowa, it's a little over $3.5 million a year. The 
The Bee Informed Partnership does a survey of honeybee keepers every year. So the gray bars show what beekeepers estimate is an acceptable loss of winter hives. To them, acceptable means they don't have to rebuild their operations. It's not kind of on the order of catastrophic or economically damaging to them. So that's the beekeepers' desired levels of winter losses, knowing that, of course, every winter they're going to lose some hives. And then the yellow bars show how much they're actually been losing. And they started collecting data on the annual loss, which includes summer losses. So you can see there's this trend of, of exceeding what they would like to. The, the honeybees aren't doing as well as, as, as they would like. That's economically healthy for the beekeepers. There's many pollinators out there. There's 21 species of bumblebees alone in the eastern US. There's not just bumblebees, there's the little sweat bees, cuckoo bees, leafcutter bees. There's a tremendous diversity of bees out there that are really good pollinators. So some crops depend more on native bees than honeybees, like greenhouse tomatoes, squash, alfalfa. Those rely on the native bees. So native bees are worth $3 billion annually in the United States. And studies have shown they're not doing as well either. Many native bee populations are also declining. Of course, monarch butterflies are very charismatic. People really like them. The number of hectares, which is the metric for acres, has declined over the last 20 years. You can see in 2016, 2017, they only covered about three hectares or seven acres of their habitat, their overwintering habitat in Mexico. So another group of insect that's been declining. We also need to keep in mind natural enemies, which is the entomologist term for beetles, damselflies, anything that captures prey. They also like flowers. Beetles also eat pollen and nectar, and they're actually more efficient, they're better at their job if they eat pollen and nectar, because again, it's a, a nice source of nutrition for them. So we don't talk about them as much, but natural enemies also have a big economic impact because of their pest control services. Natural enemies contribute four and a half to $12 billion every year in pest control services, as far as how many aphids they eat and the damage they prevent on crops. And like other insects, they're also not doing as well, but they're not studied as much as either as the pollinators. But studies have shown that, like other insects, they have been declining somewhat. So where should we add more habitat? We're losing insects. Well, the brown on this map is cropland. The yellow is pasture. So you can see what most of the land use in Iowa is like. And that's important. We have a program here called Prairie on Farms where we have workshops. Ashley Kittle's the program manager and Justin Meissen and Greg Househill have been at the workshops. If, if any of you have been at their workshops where they educate farmers on how to plant strips within their fields. So that's important to try to educate the farmers. But Laura was the author, co-author of a paper called All Hands on Deck in regards to the monarch butterfly. And that's really what it is. All hands on deck. Anywhere we can get habitat for these beneficial insects is going to help. So this shows how much, how public land in Iowa is divided up. So public land is kind of nice because logistically it can be easier just to get on there and, and add habitat sometimes depending on the land. 60% of the public land is roadsides. That's one reason there's growing interest in getting habitat on roadsides. Followed by Iowa Department of Natural Resources land, Iowa County Conservation, and federal public lands. Of the roadsides, most of it is in county roadsides. Around 760,000 acres are in county roadsides, followed by state roadsides and city roadsides. That's the total acreage. So not all of it is ready to plant because we avoid planting by intersections, for example, but a good chunk of it might be someplace where we can add a habitat. 
So it's a lot of potential area. The good news in Iowa is we've, for a long time now, we've had the infra infrastructure to add habitat to roadsides. In the late 1980s, the Iowa legislature was very forward thinking and they created this integrated roadside vegetation management legislation in 1988. It said that Iowa's roadsides would be preserved, planted, and maintained to be safe, visually interesting, ecologically integrated, and useful for many purposes. So this is an ecological, holistic piece of legislation. It's pretty groundbreaking, really, for the late 1980s. There's also legislation that year creating the Living Roadway Trust Fund in Iowa. It's funded by 3% of REAP funds. If you've seen this license plate, that's where some of those funds go to. A tax on utility easements and a road use tax fund. And this creates a large pot of money on the order of 800,000 or so that states, counties, and cities can apply for this money to support their IRVM programs. Another kind of unique piece of legislation that there's a pot of money for, to support roadside activities. So IRVM basically consists of native, seeding of native species. A lot of these photos will be from Kirk Henderson, the longtime IRVM program manager. He left me a really nice library of pictures. Some of them will be mine, but he just had such a great selection of pictures from his many years in the roadside program. So with the steep slopes, a lot of times the, the roadsides are hydro seeded. It can be hard to get a drill on, so that's what that green mulch is. It also consists of reducing the use of herbicides, just avoiding just blanket spraying the entire roadside, just targeting the really bad spots reducing mowing, and using prescribed fire. Those are kind of the three basic elements of, of IRVM. Every year I, I apply for a, a large federal seed grant from the Fi Federal Highways Administration, the Transportation Alternatives Program. And I offer the counties two different kinds of seed mixes, a lower diversity mix of around 20 species total, and then a higher diversity mix of around 40 species total. So the clean-out mix is more for areas that tend to get cleaned out a lot, a ditch clean out where they're, they're cleaning out silt that comes into the ditch. So we figure rather than invest a lot of money in those kinds of sites, they're less degraded. They have the lower diversity mix, but on the better sites, they can use the higher diversity mix. The seed mixes include a good variety of nectar plants. We try to include species that flower across the growing season. So you want food to be out there from early on to later on, and more than one species, of course, maybe two or three species at any given time. We try to have a mix of legumes, different kinds of flowers that establish more quickly versus longer. And one question I often get is, well, aren't you just kind of luring these pollinators to their deaths? It's right by the roadside. Well, st studies have shown that relative to the local population, less than 10% of the population is usually killed by being hit by cars. There's a study done in central Iowa that showed there's less roadkill when there's the, the prairie plants along the road compared to just grass. And the thinking is, well, maybe if there's a lot of flowers, they're just staying in a straight line foraging on the flowers. Maybe there's less need to cross the road. But if there's grass, they're just, they're crossing, looking, looking for flowers. So this map shows how involved counties in, or how involved counties are in IRVM. So IRVM is mandatory at the state level. The legislation said IRVM shall be practiced along state roadsides, but it may be practiced along county roadsides. So it's voluntary. Counties in yellow have a roadside manager. Counties with a number shows how many years out of the last 20 years the county has chosen to get the native seed. And this is a little silhouette of the IRVM symbol, this little black check mark looking thing. And that means the county has an IRVM plan on file with the Iowa DOT. 
So if they, if they have an IRBM plan, that's really important because that means they're eligible to apply for those grants from that pot of money. So you can see some counties have been highly involved over the last 20 years. Then there's some counties, maybe seven, that have really never gotten any seed or gotten involved. So I've talked to, to some of these counties that haven't been involved, and some of them want to be, but they face different barriers. Maybe politically the situation isn't right. They know the County Board of Supervisors isn't supportive of hiring a roadside manager. Maybe they don't have enough funding. There's different reasons why they don't get involved. And some counties just don't know much about the program. This map shows which department a roadside manager is housed in. So there's 44 counties with a roadside manager. So this is typically someone with a conservation background, someone who knows their native plants well, who knows how to run equipment, knows how to plant the seed, maintain it. Around two-thirds of the counties, the roadside managers in the secondary roads department, so they work for the engineer, county engineer. Around one-third of the counties in green, they work in the conservation department. And there's five counties where they report directly to the Board of Supervisors. That's what independent means, they report directly to the Board of Supervisors. So basically, I work with four communities in Iowa, the roadside managers, the engineers, the conservation departments, and the boards of supervisors. Those are the main people I interact with, trying to encourage them to, to do IRVM or support them if they, for the roadside managers, if they're doing IRVM. So I, or, I organize an annual roadside conference that's held every September. that helps bring the roadside managers together and they learn from different speakers, learn from each other. So to sum up so far, before I move on, we've lost a lot of tall grass prairie in Iowa, and some beneficial insect populations are declining, and county roadsides are one area we can add or protect. I'm focusing on adding, but we can also protect. Some counties are very involved in protecting their remnants. Add or protect more habitat. But Counties face barriers to adding habitat to the rights of way, even the ones that do, do IRVM. There's, sometimes there's barriers. Therefore, I'm trying to figure out ways to help remove these barriers. So that'll be kind of the focus of the rest of my talk, how to remove these barriers. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different approaches. I'm mostly going to talk about the social sciences. By social sciences, I mean environmental psychology, conservation psychology, and one particular aspect of that called community-based social marketing. I'm also going to talk about a white paper I'm working on with a collaborator. So why social sciences? Why am I interested in that to address this challenge? Well, early in my career, I was a restoration ecologist with the Corps of Engineers in Omaha. I designed restoration plans for riparian forests and grassland restorations, especially if they were near rivers. The Corps deals a lot with rivers and floodplains and that sort of thing. At that time, I thought, well, if I educate the public, I provide them with all this great information and facts, they're going to support our programs, it's, it's going to be great. But then, in reality, the longer I worked there, and you start working with these really diverse communities, we worked with Native American tribes, natural resource districts, which largely consist of farmers, wildlife departments like South Dakota Game, Fish, and Parks. These are just some examples of some of the communities we worked with. And each one is so unique. Each one has different goals or objectives. They have different cultures, regulations, policies. It's not so simple as just showing up and educating them about the environment. There's challenges to each of those and implementing those, those behaviors, those environmental conservation behaviors we want them to do. I, I grew to appreciate the importance of barriers and how that can get in the way of them actually implementing ecosystem restoration. About 10 years ago, there was an opportunity for me to, to take a fellowship with a PhD program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. It was very applied. 
and that really appealed to me. And it was interdisciplinary. And that also appealed me, to me, because at the Engin Corps of Engineers, I had to start to learn how to work with all these different disciplines. So my PhD research actually focused on the ecosystem services of tall grass prairie. So I, was, I, I loved it. I was out in the field collecting all this great data on tall grass prairie. But also, I got to work with people in other disciplines, which I, I enjoy because it's kind of challenging to, to learn how to learn from them, I guess. So most of this group in this program consisted of people with ecologists and geologists. We also had a few social scientists. We had a law psychologist, a policy analyst, and a social scientist. So by conversations with them, I started, started to deepen my understanding of social sciences a little bit and how they're important for understanding how you actually get conservation going on the ground. So when I started working here, my first year here, I heard about this, this workshop that was being held in Madison, Wisconsin. It was taught by Dr. Doug McKenzie Moore, Introduction to Community-Based Social Marketing. So he's an environmental psychologist. He has taught workshops to over 20,000 environmental professionals worldwide, mostly in North America. He's also gone to Australia and New Zealand and Canada, I guess. Well, Canada's part of North America. So he's gotten around and he's really practitioner focused, which really appealed to me. He's trying to encourage practitioners, how do you apply some of these social science techniques in your work? He's written a couple of books, Fostering Sustainable Behavior and Social Marketing to Protect the Environment. So the first one kind of outlines his approach. The second one has case studies of how this has been applied in different communities. So like some other environmental psychologists, he's found just blanket information campaigns that aren't really targeted, are really good at increasing awareness, affecting attitudes, but they're less effective with actually affecting behaviors, which doesn't mean these aren't important. I have brochures myself. It helps increase awareness and affect attitudes. That's important. But in and of itself, it can be less effective with affecting behaviors, depending on how they're designed. So community-based social marketing it kind of combines psychology and social marketing with behavior change. So psychology is more focused on the individual. Habitats, perceptions, how do people change? We're in January. If you've ever made a New Year's resolution, you can probably relate to this, that people tend to recognize the benefits of a behavior, but actually doing it is another thing. But that can also be applied to whole communities as well, where the social marketing comes in. So it's delivered at the community level. It focuses on removing barriers and enhancing the activity's benefits. And it's a five-step process. So the first step is to select behaviors. So these are the on-the-ground behaviors that directly affect the environment. It's not the strategy, like hiring a roadside manager, that's a strategy. It's the on-the-ground behavior. So I'll explain what those are. So one is planting native plants in the roadsides. Maintaining the plantings, that's another separate behavior. Because your results, if you just plant versus and just go away versus plant and maintain, might be pretty different, depending on where the site is. Spot spraying of herbicides. Preserving the per roadside prairie remnants. And evaluating the success of plantings. The second step is to uncover the barriers and benefits to doing each of those behaviors. And I came across this great quote. Rather than educating the public, we perhaps first need the public to educate us a bit. So that kind of reflects the, kind of the shift I've been going through <laughs> in my career. I still lapse towards some sometimes, so I just want to present these facts. But I'm trying to keep in mind, well, maybe I need to listen to the public first and keep in mind their needs, their culture, their concerns, their limitations. That kind of drives what I'm, I'm trying to do with my program. 
there's four ways you can uncover barriers and benefits. One is a literature search to see if anyone else has done studies or surveys in the area you're looking at. Observations, depending on what the behavior is, you can just go out and observe. For example, if someone's trying to target littering, well, you can just kind of sit in the park and observe how often it happens. Some behaviors are easier to observe than others. This is less applicable to my program. Focus groups, which are in-depth interviews of a small group of people in that community you're, you're interested in. And surveys, which are broad, written surveys. So each one has pros and cons. Ideally, you do all four. It's called triangulation, where you combine different methods and you get a more robust picture. And of course, it depends on time and funding and energy, what you can do. So the focus groups, you have a very small group, but very in-depth, valuable information, but then you lose the breadth. And then the surveys, you have a, a broader audience, which is kind of nice. So one research resource for doing literature search is the Fostering Sustainable Behavior website. So this is the community-based social marketing website. Uh, Dr. Moore's first book is online for free, and he has different forums where people can post case studies of how they're applying this. There's discussion groups. There's different sectors. If you're interested in er energy use or transportation, water, waste and pollution, ag and conservation, there's different groups you can go and just kind of browse and see how much there is. Some areas have a lot more than others, but it's kind of a neat website. And he also has a, a listserv you can subscribe to. So I received funding from the Living Rotary Trust Fund to do surveys. So I was really interested in how counties that use IRVM implement it. So I wanted to know how often they burn, what kind of techniques do they use to prevent invasive species from coming in, how they, kind of the nuts and bolts of how they apply it. And I also wanted to know what the county engineers and the roadside managers think about IRVM. Because in counties that don't have a roadside manager, the engineer is kind of the default contact person for roadside management. So some counties, maybe with the engineer and the roadside manager, can relate to IRVM, but some counties it's just the engineer. So in 2016, I collaborated with the UNI Center for Social and Behavioral Research. So you have Andrew Stevenson here. He was one of the collaborators and designers of the survey, and Dr. Mary Loesch was on this survey team. So all 99 county engineers, and at that time there was 38 county roadside managers received an online link to a survey. If they didn't respond to the online link, they were mailed the survey. They're given two or three reminders and then mailed the survey. The response rate was really good. 65% of county engineers and 94% of roadside managers responded to the survey. So it's excellent. For surveys, I mean, if people are familiar with surveys, that's, that's a really good response. So the results are in a report. At the end of my talk, I'll give my email address. If you want a copy of the report, I can email you a PDF of it. So it's summarized in, in this survey of county engineers and roadside vegetation managers. So I'm just going to highlight a few findings from it so you can get a feel. Like I said, there's a lot of really neat information about how the roadside managers actually do it, but actually do the roadside spraying or mowing or burning. But I'm just going to focus more on the kind of social aspects. So one question was, what are the most influential factors in how you decide to implement roadside management strategies? So the blue is going to be the roadside manager. The green is going to be the county engineer. So as you can see, maintenance cost savings was pretty important to both groups, followed by minimizing health or safety hazards. And it's actually a little bit more important to the roadside managers than engineers. So one reason we do surveys is, is because we tend to make assumptions. The, the social scientists tell me, well, we tend to make assumptions about what people are going to think. But when you survey them, sometimes they don't always follow what you, you think people are going to do. So this is kind of interesting results. But sometimes it does, it does follow as you expect. So the roadside managers thought environmental stewardship was more important than engineers. And look how important public input surveys customer complaints was to the engineers. It was a lot more important to them compared to the roadside managers. 
So we asked the two groups, what are the benefits of Ayurveda? They both had the same top three benefits. It's just the, and so the darker color shows they strongly agree, and the slightly lighter color just means they agree. So you can see the, the roadside managers just more strongly agreed than the engineers that the roadsides are attractive, more strongly agreed, provides water quality, and more strongly agreed that enhances biodiversity. So there's 10 different benefits that they, they responded to. We asked them, how would you rate your agency's experience using native plantings from not at all challenging to extremely challenging? And in green, the engineers thought it was more challenging than the roadside managers. So of those that said it was at least somewhat challenging, we asked them, well, what are the primary challenges? One was the length of time for the natives to establish. That's kind of a continuing concern that we need to try to address. It's just, it takes patience. It takes patience to grow natives. It takes them a few years to really get established. Well, second and third challenges, interference with the native plantings by adjacent landowners who mow the plantings or who sprayed the plantings with herbicides. So sometimes it's accidental. Sometimes there is misunderstanding or the landowner thinks they own the ditch or even if they know it's public property, it's right by their land, so they feel like they have a right to just kind of go in and mow and spray it. But it depends. Some, some roadside managers say they have good, pretty good luck with landowners. Some don't, or it just depends on the area of the county they're in. But it is one of the top challenges that they identified. So in 2017, I got funding for a follow-up survey, again, with the Center for Social and Behavioral Research. This time, we surveyed the county conservation board directors and the chairs of the county boards of supervisors. So they're important because the county conservation board directors, they kind of control the purse strings. They, they have a lot of influence on who gets hired in a county. And the conservation board directors, again, they're another department that can employ a roadside manager. So they're kind of more administrative types. While the engineers and roadside managers were more connected to, to doing the field work. But the, the engineers can also supervise roadside managers as well. But this is more administrative based, this, this audience. Again, we had a, a good response rate for, for these communities. 64% of the county conservation board directors and 51% of the chairs of county boards of supervisors responded. It's another report that's completed and available for me if you want a, a PDF of it. So we asked them a similar question, what's the impact of possible influences on roadside vegetation management decision making? And they were given a, a little bit wider range of responses and options, but consideration of safety was pretty important. And maintenance cost savings, again. So this seems like it's, it's probably pretty important to try to collect data. We're trying to figure out a good way to, to get some data on this, the cost savings of having an IRVM program. It's kind of challenging because each county is so unique. And it depends on what they were doing before IRVM, how much they were mowing or what they were spraying, how much they were spending. But that's one goal I'd like to do is try to get more of that data. We asked them, what are the factors that lead you to hire a roadside manager? So one of the top ones was improving my community for both groups, followed by environmental stewardship, leadership of local staff. So this can be a big selling point. One county I went to, I pointed out that, well, the roadside manager, that's their, their job is to manage the roadside vegetation. It kind of lifts some of the burden of the engineer. They have someone, like a go-to person who can manage the roadsides, coordinate with contractors if they contract. It's just, logistically, it's just kind of nice for the county to have a, a designated person to deal with the roadsides and the public who knows their plants. It's a real asset to the county. And it doesn't fall completely on the engineers. That was a big selling point for them. I think it seems like for a lot of groups, maybe not just the engineer, but the county board of supervisors recognize that. The conservation board director recognizes that. So 
So we asked counties that don't have an IRVM program how likely they would consider participating in IRVM in the next five years. So the good news is most of them either would definitely consider or might or might not consider. So they're kind of ambivalent. So I think these groups might still be reachable, though, because maybe they just need a little, little push, like a, get some county folks in there and just kind of work with them. And 25% of the conservation board directors said they would not consider compared to 5% of the board of supervisors. So again, it's just an illustration of a, it's kind of different than you would expect. You'd think, well, the conservation board, they're, so it's just kind of interesting. We asked these two groups the benefits of IRVM. Their top three, their benefits that were higher tended to be a little bit different. Reducing blowing snow. That was really important to the Board of Supervisors compared to the, the Conservation Board Directors, for example. Saves money both long and short term. That was important to the, to the groups. So money savings, it's, just, it's a little bit higher for the administrative county officials. It's more on their mind compared to some of the environmental benefits. But reducing spread of invasive species, that's important to the Board of Supervisors. So we asked these two groups, what are the barriers to implementing IRVM? So the conservation board thought, yes, there was a lot more barriers than the board of supervisors. So they're more in tune with the, the lack of staff capacity and support. Other concerns in the county being a higher priority. So that was pretty large. Insufficient proof of cost savings, so this comes up again. So those are some highlights of, of those studies. Like I said, there's a lot more information in the reports themselves, but I don't want to bore you with too many graphs. So. so the next step will be to develop strategies based on these surveys. How can we help these counties based on the barriers that they've identified? So another approach I'm, I'm using to help create the case for, for Habitat is being part of the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group. This was started three years ago by Iris Caldwell, who's down here. She's with the University of Illinois Chicago Energy Resources Center. And this is a collaboration of people who work in the utility industry and with roadsides. Initially, it was pretty much people around the Midwest, but she's really expanded the group. So there's people more and more from the coast and other parts of the country. There's been five workshops so far where she draws everyone together in Chicago. We, we have lectures, we get into breakout sections and just discuss different issues, different challenges we're facing in our industries of, of how do we create this case for, for adding habitat to rights away, whether it's utility corridors or roadsides. And the workshops have drawn anywhere from around 60 to 100 people. So Iris and I are collaborating, we're calling it a white paper for lack of a, a better term. It's more like a, a bulleted list. We're trying to make it really user friendly that identifies the benefits and the challenges, so in the business world, challenges is the word they like to use, while the social scientists like to use barriers. It's just a little language thing, but it's kind of the same concept. So we have around a dozen, but in the interest of space, I'm not gonna show you all a dozen, but if you wanna see the outline, you can just email me and I can provide the outline. So this is kind of an example, like one, cost savings from changes in management practice, and we have a sub-bullet. Reduced mowing reduces operational costs. Selective chemical use reduces operational costs. Regulatory impacts, and there's different sub-items. So these are the benefits that, we, that we've identified. So my surveys have kind of fed into this, but it's also just anything that we've heard from people interacting with them or other people have heard the benefits that they see to adding habitat. Then for each of these, these little sub-items, we'll have bullet points that address each one. So here's some studies that have shown how much you can save from mowing. And most of the information is at the state level. 
there's not other states that really do much at the county level. So what we're drawing on is the state level. We really need to add some, some county information. But at least this is out there and there's a lot of people, a lot of states interested in doing more along their state highways. There's also the challenges, some example of that. Adjacent landowner cooperation, which has come up not only in our surveys, but just talking to, to people. They're working in roadsides. Uh, so landowners planting crops. Sometimes they'll plant crops in the public right away. That's another challenge besides mowing and spraying. And then the cost of initial investment in seed equipment. That's just a couple examples. Again, that's the first two of like around a dozen or so challenges. Then as an example, here's one item, lack of public support, and then we're going to have bullets. We summarize the, the concern and then the response, and then we have a citation. So if you know of anyone who'd like to coordinate or like contribute to the paper, just let me know, or if you want to see the paper, the outline of the paper. We're, it's a work in progress. We're just continually adding to this paper. We're hoping it'll be a really good resource for people because we're getting all sorts of questions. People want to help, they want to add habitat, but they're, they're facing the, the challenges or they don't know what all the benefits are. So the next working group is, is going to be in a different location than Chicago. It's going to be in Washington, D.C. So she's really expanding. She's making more inroads with, with larger utility entities. So in conclusion, there's a variety of benefits and barriers or challenges, whichever you prefer, for adding habitat to rights away. And they vary by community. So it's important to keep that in mind. So your approach with each community is going to vary. So outreach efforts need to consider the unique needs of each community, really listen to, to them, understand them. And as I mentioned earlier, the next steps are to pilot strategies to encourage adoption of IRVM activities. So this can, this can consist of maybe, one thing I'm thinking of is having an, a farmer in a county who has a lot of social influence, for example. If you can get that farmer to put a sign next to their native planting, showing they support it, that's one way you can really influence the locals. Anytime you can get someone within a community that people respect and make it visible some way that they're supporting that, whether it's an article in a magazine or a sign that's visible, that's an example of one way you can influence. Another is to, to gather more of this cost-benefit information or the, the cost before and after doing IRVM. The conservation board, or the, a lot of the county officials said, if I present at the Iowa State Association of Counties, they said that's a good way they'd like to learn more about the program, so that might be another, another opportunity. But we're considering having a panel because like, the messenger is important too. So I can talk, but if we have a farmer and a roadside manager, maybe a county engineer, a panel of county people, that's what influences them. So they, people from their own community are on that panel. That might be a way to reach people. So that's kind of another neat thing about the survey. We asked them, how would you like to learn more about ARVM? What works for them? So for more information, you can go to the ARVM page on the Tallgrass Prairie Center website. The two reports from the surveys are also on there. If you just want to download them from there, you can do that. And my contact information is there. Iris's contact information, if you want to learn more about that working group, on her website she has a resources page that you can go into and you look for reports and that sort of thing. You can ask her to be added to her mailing list or how you can access the resource page. She's the best contact for utility corridors. That's her main area. But if you want to learn more about roadside, she also has that accumulated, a lot of roadside resources on her webpage. And if you want the outline, you can just email me. Like I said, the outline of that white paper that we're calling it for now. And then if you want more information about community-based social marketing, that's that website I showed you earlier, with the case studies and the discussion groups. So that's my approach I'm taking to IRVM, trying to understand communities and help them. We grow daylilies, mm -hmm. and we are not intentionally doing very many prairie plants, but we've considered it and talked about it. When we bought the land in 2005, we could control thistle spots, spots burning. In the last year, I don't know where the church 
came from, but down at the end of the pasture where the water runs through, where all the farmers' uh, drain pump comes through, there is now this field of thistles. And the farmer, mm. I don't mind it, but the farmer obviously doesn't like that. You can't even get in to like work on the waterway because it would get clogged or whatever in the fence. So my, I have a very pragmatic question about how do we integrate plants without having invasive species come in because otherwise we're a negative example and we could convince the farmers, you know, don't go there. So I don't know if you have any practical information if things I could grow that would be less offensive and less problematic for the farmers um, and would be a positive contribution. Is your question that you're getting invasives coming into your daylilies or where's the... Oh, no, I'm not concerned. I'm not a manager. I hand Right. Yeah, I can do mine, and I can up on where our flowers are, but it's down where the waterway is, where it impacts the local farmer. That's what the issue is, because he has to get access in to go keep that water flowing, and then he comes in to, he drives through there to get to his farm and his crops, and that shrubs, I mean, it's, it's so much, I'm, I'm telling you, this thistle patch is as big as this room, seriously, and so he can't, it's a problem. And, and I know people going up and down the road see that, and it's like, oh, the people who bought that place, you know, where are they bringing in all this thistle? And, you know, so I don't know if you have any management strategies, but what could I plant something different there that would help alleviate that? Well, diverse mixes of natives, eventually they would be able to keep out some of the invasives. The more diversity you have, studies have shown the more diverse plant communities you have, the better they're able to resist invasives coming in. One more question, but piggybacking on that and then I'll stop. How do I get it started? Because what I've been doing is I've been wheelbarrowing down like different plant material and sort of dumping it there in a compost pile and thinking that some of that will stop those. Mm -hmm. Because I can't just get in, uh, short of just putting pesticide or herbicide over the whole thing and trying to get in there with something, I don't know how else to compete with the thistle. Mm -hmm. Maybe after the talk, right. someone can talk one-on-one because -on -one, it sounds kind of like a unique situation. Oh, maybe, you. maybe that'd be. Sorry. No, that's okay. That's a good <laughs> question, but I'd, I'd have to understand a little bit better. Or someone, yeah. Yes. Do you have any sense from the survey how many plants are out there? Do you have any sense from the survey of an explanation for the bottom two tiers of counties in Iowa um, and why they seem so reluctant to be involved? The main reason seems to be there's a lower tax base. There's less population there. You'll notice the counties with the, the urban areas, most of them have long-standing roadside programs. But those southern two tiers is just the lower population. But we do have Ringgold County, which is one of the least, population, least populated counties in the whole state. They are interested in getting a roadside manager, so, which would be kind of neat because they're kind of making inroads into that area because they just they see the benefits. They haven't been seeding their roadsides, and they're having a lot of erosion issues. So for them, it's all about erosion. So they're, it's a priority for them. They're trying to make it work, for example. But it's just it's a little bit more challenging because of the lack of funding. But there's certainly interest. There's other counties I've talked to down there. They want to. They're just trying to figure out the logistics of how to fund the road manager. Yes? What are the plants are they planting the most? As yeah. far as the, the, the roads, what, what are the biggest, what are the leaders? As far as natives or, yeah, or anything. native, what types of species? Yeah. Big blue stem, Canada wild rye, Indian grass, little blue stem. Those are the main grasses. Western wheatgrass, we provide that in our seed mixes. And compared to other prairies, because of the steep slopes, we tend to include a higher proportion of grass seed compared to a more level prairie for the erosion concerns. Any other questions? In terms of the number of acres that are being planted over the years, have you seen an increase or is it staying pretty constant with how the counties have planted? In the last five to ten years, I think there's roughly been anywhere from 800 to 1,300 acres of seed planted every year. It, they can order the seed in 10 acre increments, anywhere from 10. There's a couple counties that get up to around 100 acres every year. 
what they order. But it's, it's roughly remained in that er range, 800 to 13 acres every year planted around the state. Now, how many county acres do you typically get, David? Like you um, it's, I've planted the last few years about 25 acres. Okay, good. Yeah, David's a roadside manager from Bremer County, so he's local. Any other questions? What are you finding as far as uh, improved road sites where they go back, they go in there and they uh, uh, maybe put new culverts in, uh, shoulders in? Uh, there's, I think there's a, a deal out there that tells them they have to plant uh, like a perennial rye as a ground cover. How are they going to buy that? Instead of, you know, in the initial phase, why can't we just go in and plant total cover of the, the total cover of, of the habitat as opposed to the shorter grasses. Why you wouldn't just go out and just plant the natives you mean as yeah, opposed to the natives. well typically a nurse crop is added just to kind of add some cover and stabilize the soil because it takes the natives so long to put down the root systems. Yeah. That's why there's typically a nurse crop added if Isn't there that's a request good. out there for from water to be primarily tall fescue to begin with? I'm not familiar with if many counties are using tall fescue I, I haven't heard of that at least myself. It's not that it's out there, just the counties I've worked there with. There are some that are using uh, tall fescue, um, a perennial rye um, in, their, in a mix that they're calling more of a shoulder mix that there might be more disturbances rather than putting the natives in um, where the natives are going to get disturbed in a few years or if there's a lot of um, Canada thistle um, or some other kind of perennial weed that they're gonna have to do spraying on. They might do more of just a grass mix on those areas so that you can go ahead and treat those areas with herbicide um, to get rid of the invasive weeds. Um, or if there's gonna be a lot of more disturbance put on them, they aren't going to put the effort into putting natives there, they're going to save those seeds for areas that they can manage more for native planting. So there aren't, a lot of them aren't just putting the natives out and leaving them, they're actually going in and um, managing those areas too. Thank you, David. Do you have time for maybe one more question and then please stick around if you can have more cookies and, and come see our combine if you want. <laughs> so, um, maybe one more question? Yes. Uh, we've got about 45 acres of uh, prairie that's about 30 years old, and we're about 50 miles northwest of here, and we're fortunate to have this big giant power line running through our property. And uh, <coughs> there's another uh, landowner that has the property across the road from us and the power line runs back down the road and uh, that was all timber and they they cleared a lot of that timber um, for the power line and um, left it with just stumps and all the trees that they cut were bulldozed up against the, the remaining woods there and there's black locusts and and thistles growing in that probably eight to ten acres that they cleared and I'm just wondering um, they were pretty cooperative with us in what they've done to our property uh, but um, the people that own these woods have just not cooperated with them all so they just hmm. packed up and left and uh, so it's leaving such a mess for for us because we're dealing with these black locusts drifting over our prairie mm -hmm. constantly and the thistles, and I just, I don't know what the responsibility for this power line is. Do you have any ex other experience with that? Mm, I'm not sure like what their jurisdiction is, or I'm just less familiar with power lines or that particular company or. Yeah, it's, it's just uh, it's kind of, I guess it's out of our hands because this, this other power, the, the other landowner isn't doing anything about it, but uh, mm. you can't mow it because uh, there's all this, you know, there's hundreds of stumps out there. Mm. <laughs> mm. I mean, it's just left to be a jungle. Hmm. 
so they're they're I mitigating. So they mitigated some of their disturbed areas then with the prairie plants, but they're leaving other. Pardon? So they mitigated some of the areas they disturbed with the prairie mix, but they're mm -hmm. leaving other stumps, you're saying? Okay. They, 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 they remade all our prairie and they didn't have any stumps. Okay. Yeah. But it's all this stuff that's coming out now all along the edges of our prairies mm -hmm. that are spreading to our prairies that we just can't keep up with that. And just the, just the woods that they cleared that's, that's growing up to, you know, that's growing up to uh, black locusts anyway and thistles. Mm -hmm. Maybe afterwards one of us could talk to you about the, the black locust who's more well, let's go ahead in the trees. Thank you. And also on your way out there's free calendars and brochures if you're interested in any of that. Roadside calendars and roadside brochures. Can I ask a question about you know how Cedar Falls has this new roundabout?